Thank you so much for that song. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me. We're going to find ourselves finishing out the book of James. We have went through around 18 messages in the book of James. I'm happy about that. And we've learned so much from James. He has not pulled any punches with us. It's hard to preach James with subtlety because he's so straightforward with his message. But as we come to the end of the book of James in chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, we're going to learn this from the text this morning, that genuine faith, genuine faith causes believers, causes you and I, to patiently pursue and to plead with those who wander from the faith. Genuine faith causes believers to patiently pursue and plead with those who wander from the faith. When I was uh, a little kid, my grandma took my brother and I uh, hiking. And my grandma wasn't a hiker. She was a, a, a short lady, uh, pretty round, rotundra, if you will, uh, Feisty little woman, short steps, but we wanted to go uh, in the in the hills and in, in back where we were at my grandpa's place in, in Crosby, and they had uh, this kind of Indian mound back in the woods and some trails and some just stuff back there, really really old. My brother and I wanted to go look at it. We liked going back there and play, and so we wasn't trusted to go up there by ourselves. And so my grandma said, "You know, I'll take you." And so she walks down the road with us. She goes up the the gravel road. It's a big long gravel hill. We go up. And she walks with us a little bit in the woods, and uh, she stops. She said, all right, it's right on up ahead. Y'all just go right on up ahead, look at it, turn around, and come back. Well, my brother and I were very similar to my two sons, Jason and Jacob. Uh, once, once we just get to do it, we forget that other people exist beside us and what we're doing. So we went, we did exactly what my grandma said, and then uh, four hours later, they had cops and firefighters and townspeople looking for us for where we were at. We, we strayed from the path that we were supposed to be on. She said, it, it, it was, you go straight up. I mean, it wasn't a lot of curves. It, it wasn't you know, down. It was really open. She said, just go straight. Go look. Go check out the, the little hill, the little mound up there. Go, go, go see what it's about. And he just come straight back. And we said, yes, ma'am. We had full intentions to do what she said do. But somewhere between... Here and there, we, we went off by several miles. Let me ask you this this morning. Think about your own Christian walk. Have you ever strayed from Jesus? Have you ever strayed from the truth of God's word? Have you ever strayed from living out that truth? You have a conviction and you know what to be true, but yet you do otherwise for various reasons. You stray. You run off from Christ. You miss the blessing. You experience discipline. But you find yourself maybe back today. What, what was it that brought you back? Maybe you're here right now, but you can feel yourself in mind or in behavior beginning to move away from what you know to be right. Beginning to move away from the rock that is Jesus Christ. What's causing you to do that? Why are you straying away? In our text this morning, James 5, 19 to 20, we're going we're gonna to check that out. We're going to see what the Bible has to say for us. And as we've worked through the book of James, we've learned about trials. We've learned how to acquire wisdom. We've learned the difference between earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. We've learned about what it means to be partial to people and believers in the Lord's house and to show favoritism. We've learned how to properly handle and evaluate and think about money. We've, we've understood what it means to have faith and have works We've seen what worldliness can do and how it can impact the believer. And James has really spent the bulk of chapter 5 walking with us, showing us what it means to have patience. And as he comes to verses 19 and 20, 
we're going to have patience with those who stray from the faith, who stray from the Word of God, who stray from the church of God. Let's look at our text this morning. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Father God, as we open your word, as we turn to the text this morning, would you fill our hearts with wisdom and awe and reverence for your word? Would your spirit move in our mind and our heart to help us to understand, to help us to know, to help us value, to help us live out the truths contained within your word? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what's interesting about this particular text is it's only two verses, but I got seven points out of it. You are welcome. Did a lot of work for this text. But here's the deal. I'm not proof texting when I say I got, we got seven points. We're going to go through seven big ideas. It's, it, we'll get through in a regular amount of time, I promise. Don't be scared. Don't, don't worry. But what, what, what I wanted to do with this text is the, this text really has a lot to say, and I wanted to pull from the rest of the Bible and see what the rest of God's Word has to say about this and how it can help you and I mend and, and minister to and plead with those who have strayed, and, and for those of us who may be strained now to help see holistically what the Bible has to say to us about this. But the first thing we're going to see this morning is this, that for those who stray, for those who wander, that we make a conscious decision to stray from the truth. It's not accidental for you and I to stray from the truth. We make a conscious decision to stray from the truth. Look at the text. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth. Now what's interesting is he's used the word my brethren. He uses this word several times in the text. And it lets us know he's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. He is not talking to lost people. He's not talking to people who do not know Jesus. He's talking to people who know Jesus. And this word that he uses, stray, it means to wander off, to veer off the course, to be deceived by, to be led away in error. So he says, church folks, my brothers, my sisters, fellow believers who've placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you may have wandered off from the truth. And, and what truth is he referring to? He's referring to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's referring to the truth about who Jesus is and the impact that Jesus has on our life. So James is telling us that, that, that there are those among us that have the potential and those among us that even have moved off. You've moved away from the truth of who Jesus is and what he has to say. But this is really interesting because he uses this, this participle, a very interesting participle, that he doesn't use in chapter 1 when talking about trials. See, in chapter 1, when he's talking about trials, he says, when you encounter various trials, consider it joy, my brother. But notice what he does when he's talking about strain. He says, if any among you stray. See, trials for the believer are outside of the believer's control and come into the life of the believer that we all will deal with. Strain, wondering from the truth of who Jesus is and the impact that he has in our life is an if. That is a conscious choice that we make internally to move away from what we know is true. So James says, if, if you move away, that, that is a personal thing upon us. It's the truth of God's word. It's right doctrine and, and right behavior. Think of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, 11 through 32. He went away from his father. He left his family for what purpose? He made a conscious decision to leave to seek worldly pleasure and self-indulgence. How often have we strayed? How often have we left the father's house for self-indulgence? and worldly pleasure. If you go back to the Old Testament, uh, King David's grandson, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, 
in 1 Kings chapter 12. He's taking over for his dad, and he has his dad's advisors there. And uh, his dad's advisors tell him, hey, if, if you will be gentle, if you will be kind to the people, if you will lead them with meekness, they will love you and they will follow you and they will do more for you even than they did for your father. And he goes and he talks to his friends, those young guys. And he says, what should I do? And, and, and they said, disregard all that. He said, he said you tell them that, that I have more power in my thumb to, to put the weight on you than my father had in his whole army at all his disposal. He, he turned aside from, from godly, wise counsel to foolish counsel in the search of approval of his peers. Oh, how often have we done that? Maybe you're here this morning, you're at a place where you feel you've been sliding from the truth. Maybe you're in school, maybe it's junior high, high school has got you, and, and all the stuff around that's going on in your life. Maybe you're at college, and, and then all those peer pressure things are coming, and you know the truth of what you were raised with. You know the truth of God's word that's been in you. You know the realness of God. You've seen, already seen God work in your life, even as, even as a teenager. But, but the, the pull from outside is causing you to sidestep that truth. For what? For approval? For people that's going to leave after high school and you're not even going to know their names in five years? For what? How often we lay aside the truth for worldly pleasure or approval of others. And more often than not, the approval we're seeking, the approval we want, is from people who don't know Jesus. See, the slide from truth is usually subtle changes, subtle decisions, subtle choices over a period of time. It is rarely one big sweeping decision that happens in a moment. Don't allow yourself to be led astray. The second thing based off this first principle is this, that believers, when we stray, we can stray from the truth in either belief or behavior. We can stray from the truth in belief or behavior. We can believe the wrong things about God. We can believe the wrong things about Scripture. We know what to be true, but we've allowed ourselves to be led astray. You just think in modern terms, so some of this stuff is oneness Pentecostalism. Is it denies the Trinity. It says that Jesus is not part of the Trinity. So we know that is against the word of God. So we know that not to be true, right? The prosperity gospel, which tells you if you just do all this, this health, wealth, and prosperity, which says if you, if you just believe, if you just have faith, that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy, and he wants you to live the, your best life now. The problem is that goes against everything Scripture says about what believers are supposed to do. It violates everything Christian history has taught us about the poorness of the believer and the living for Christ under any circumstance. What's interesting, what we see right now, and, and there's not a lot of it here, but I got friends that are dealing with it in their churches. There's a growing movement of the Hebrew roots movement, people trying to go back to the Old Testament legalism and live under Old Testament law, which absolutely baffles me because it didn't work for them. Why would it work for us? And the thing that's really hitting the church right now, honestly, is we're laying aside biblical truth for cultural approval. We're laying aside biblical truth of what God says truth is. We're laying aside biblical authority of what God says a man is, what God says a woman is, what God says sex is, what God says marriage is, and it is tearing our children apart. Children are literally being mutilated for the ideologies of parents who want to fit in with their peers at work. Beloved, we cannot allow ourselves to get swept up and led astray in belief, in a wrong belief. We have to be guided. We have to be willing to take a stand. We have to be willing to be fired. We have to be willing to be ostracized. We have to be willing to, to, to be let go of everything. When Jesus says in Matthew, says, you will be hated by your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your children for believing in me. He was not just thinking of what might happen. He was foretelling what would happen to those who put Christ above all else. And we're seeing that in our culture. 
James says that those who live a double-minded life believe one thing and, and live another way. He says, he says you're double-minded. That's what he says in James chapter 1, verse 7. So what about you? Are, are you believing the wrong things about the Word of God, about the person of Christ? The second way we stray from truth is by behavior. See, a wrong belief often leads to a wrong behavior. But oftentimes what happens, we really, as Christians, we try to live this double-minded life, what James says in chapter 1, verse 7. We'll, 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 we'll claim we believe the right things, but we will behave completely opposite to fit in so that we, we don't get kicked out the, out the circle, don't we? James says that's a double-minded life. That man, that woman should not expect any blessings of God in their life. James says, know the right thing to do and do it in chapter 1, verse 25. The third thing we see in this text is this. Believers are called to rescue those who have wandered. Look, look what the text says. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back. There's this idea that, that there are those around us in our church on, on the roll, our church has 2,500 members on the roll. I dare say some have wondered. If any, if one turns him back, Beloved, there are people in this church that are part of the church. There are people in your life that you know love Jesus and belong to Jesus that have wandered from the truth of Jesus. And we are called to rescue those who have wandered off. You know, when Chris and I got married in 2005, in, in July 2005, and Katrina hit the next month, we lost everything we owned. We had a weekend's worth of clothes between us. And I can tell you, for the next 18 months, I strayed from Jesus in big sweeping waves. We, we had our whole life planned out, and it was, it was a wonderful life. She worked at Victoria's Secret, had a scholarship. I worked at UPS, had a scholarship. We were like the best college students ever. It was like this great life, and then it was all shattered. And I, I strayed from what I knew to be true. I, I, I didn't honor her. I didn't live for Christ. I, I, my, my whole world got flipped and turned upside down. I, I was longing for someone to speak into my life during those times. I was praying that God would help somebody talk sense into me, punch me in the nose, grab a hold to me spiritually. But none came. It was only through God's unmerited grace that he just convicted me enough where I saw the error of my ways. But I often think back, and, I'm, 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 and part of me is glad for those things. I've, I've learned much lessons about God's grace that I can never unlearn that will impact me for the rest of my life. But part of me can't help but think some of the sadness and sin that I, I, I put myself through and put my wife through could have been avoided if someone would have chased after this wanderer. See, beloved, there, there are those around you right now that are hurting. They may not say it, but they are crying out. For someone to reach out to them. And one of the things that I, I want to encourage you to do. And, and you, anybody over 40. This is for you to hear. We have a church full. Of some of those wonderful. Children and teenagers. You could ever have in any church. If you were to come on Sunday night. You, you're going to see probably 70 kids here. And it's amazing. And, and statistics tell us that about 70% of them, once they graduate high school, never come back. Why is that? It's not because they don't know the truth. It's not because they haven't been taught the truth. I, I, might I suggest to you part of the reason they won't come back is because they don't have a relationship with anybody outside of their age group to come back to. M might, might I challenge you to get to know our children, our junior high, and our high schoolers? Might I challenge you to get to know their names, their hobbies? Might I challenge you to not worry about what they wear or how they talk? I, I, I heard, I, I learned some new words today. The word lie doesn't mean lie anymore. They, they have a new word for lie. John, John taught it to me. What, what's the word, John? Cap. Cap. 
So the word cap now means lie. It's not a hat anymore. It means lie. So no cap means no lie. This is what John Myers taught me the other day. I don't know what world we're living in. But here's the deal. Don't let that keep you from building a relationship with somebody who in 10 years, when they graduate high school, and they're going through turmoil of what to do with their life, the pressures of their life, that you can be the person that they call because you've developed a relationship with them in Christ. That you've poured into their mom and their dad. That you've been that parent who's already raised kids that's helped pour into them as they're raising their kids. That you've talked to their kids, you've celebrated with their kids, you've cried with their kids, you've stopped and asked their kids what they're going through on the weekends, and you've prayed with them and for them, that they know they can come to you no matter what, and you are there for them, so that when they do wonder, and they will wonder, you say, how do you know that? Because every one of us has wondered. But when they do wonder, you've built a relationship with them that you can rescue them, and you can call them back. I want to challenge you to be that man, to be that woman. God has called you and I to a ministry of reconciliation. We are called because we've been reconciled to God through Christ. We've been called to be reconcilers to those who have wandered from the truth. Not just to those who don't know the truth, but also to those who've wandered from the truth. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And listen to what Paul said. From rescuing us, listen, he says, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. That's the ministry you and I have, a ministry of reconciliation. Don't let your brother or your sister wander off without reaching out to them. The fourth principle we see is this. And this is a heavy one. This is a hard one. You're not going to like this one, but it's true. Not all who come into the church are true believers. So not all who wander off will return. As a pastor, one of the things that hurts the most, that grieves you the most, is when you've loved on people, you've preached their weddings, you've preached their funerals, you've been at their hospital bed, you've cried with them, you've, you, you, you've walked alongside them, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, they just stop coming to church. They don't return your phone calls, they don't return your texts, they've ghosted you. That's one of the most painful things to deal with as a pastor. It hurts. One of the things I've learned over the years is, is I, I reach out and I chase individuals as is that I've realized that not everyone who has been a part of my church is a part of the church. That's a hard truth to wrestle with. That's a hard truth. And what I'm, I'm not saying that people won't go off for a season. I'm not saying that. But what Paul tells us is, is those who continue to walk, to live a lifestyle of unrepentant sin, continually, never turning back, never feeling conviction, They don't belong to Christ. John makes this statement, and I just want to support this with some some Bible. John says this in 1 John 2, verse 19. He says, they went out from us. He's talking about people that were in the church. They were part of the church. They were of the body of Christ, seemingly. He says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. Listen to his rationale. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. Yes, we're called to rescue the wanderer, but we also need to be aware of, and this is where wisdom comes in, that not all who wander will come back because that not all who left were part of the body. Fifth thing I want you to see in this passage is this. We are all called to rescue, but not all believers are qualified to rescue other believers. All of us are called to rescue, but not all believers are qualified to rescue. And this, you say, well, that sounds contradictory, preacher. You're going to have to dig a little deeper in that. I'm glad you want me to. See, every one of us, we just read in, in, in 2 Corinthians, right? Every one of us are called to be rescuers and reconcilers. But the problem is not all of us have the heart of a rescuer and reconciler. You understand? 
Not all of us are in a place where we can be rescuers and reconcilers. Jesus paints this picture for us in Matthew in chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. He says, Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye, you hypocrite. He says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly take the speck out of your brother's eye. Some of us are too deep in sin to be worrying about rescuing somebody who's went off, is what Jesus is saying. He's not saying don't care. He's not saying don't have compassion. He's not even, even, say, even saying don't be ready to go. He says, but be ready, be willing. Deal with your major sin first. Deal with your major life issue first. Get right with me first. And then go out. He says you need to have a, a right behavior. But you also need to have a right attitude, right spirit. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. He says, brother, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. See, Jesus talks about a behavior that is right for the rescuer. We need to have a right behavior. We don't want to go out and be a hypocrite and call someone back. Because part of the problem is what happens is, is so many times we'll go out to rescue a person and instead we... Instead of pulling them out the mud, we kick them deeper into the hole. And instead of washing them off, we sling more on top of them. You understand? The church, we've been real good about doing that, about, about shooting our own wounded. We'll, we'll prayer line them, right? And we just tell everybody their problems instead of crying with them, instead of hurting with them, instead of bleeding with them. We need to have a, a right behavior, a right attitude, right motives. Notice what Paul says. He says, you who are spiritual, you who are walking with Christ, you who are intimate with Christ, you who have the mind of Christ. He says, restore such a one that has ran off. Bear the burdens of one with gentleness. The role, the act of reconciliation, of rescuing the wonder is, is a gentle task. It's not a task that needs a baseball bat. It, it, it requires precision surgery to deal with the heart and the mind of one who's run off. You need to, we, we're, we're gentle, we're merciful, we take upon the mind of Christ. We're, we're meek and lowly, we get down there with them. We don't come to them with an air of judgment. We don't rescue someone with, 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 with self-righteousness. With, we don't come to someone telling them, I have all the answers that will fix your sin problem because the, the reality is there's only one who has the answers to fix our sin problem and his name is Jesus. And you may be here this morning and, and you've already thought of a list of 10 people in your head who've wandered off and you've said, well, I'm going to go get that one, I'm going to get that one, I'm going to get that one. Don't, because you got the wrong attitude. If you have someone pop in your mind, your heart should break for them. You shouldn't think about them in anger because they've run off. That's the wrong attitude. You're not qualified. A rescuer has a broken heart for the wounded. A reconciler has a broken heart for one who's wandered off. Let us have genuine Christ-centered relationships that allow us to, to rescue those who are perishing. Because this is the truth. And this is our next point. Rescuing a wanderer takes patience, prayer, and persistence. James says, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way, he who turns, he takes a cargo ship over a mile to make a 180 degree turn in the open ocean. It's precision, it's persistence, it's a steady path in the same direction, right? There's no manual to rescue the wanderer, really. There are principles, but there's really not a how-to manual outside of patience, prayer, and persistence. Your patience, take the long view. Don't think you're going to rescue them in a night. <laughs> how often has your mind been changed because of one conversation? Be patient. Don't rush it. 
Be a man, be a woman. If you're a rescuer, if you're a reconciler, be a man or a woman who is much in prayer. We must remember that this work of rescuing the wanderer, of reaching out to the dying, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not a work of us. It's the Spirit of God working in us, through us, and to the other person. So bathe everything before, during, and after. Through all the conversations, through the many weeks and the months, be a person, be a man, be a woman who is bathing your life and their life in prayer. Finally, I want to encourage you, if you undertake this task of reconciliation, be a persistent person, because that's what it's going to feel like sometimes. You're going to want to scream out, Ah! <laughs> He's like, would you stop preaching? And I'm like, it's almost over. Just be persistent, little man. It's okay. Don't give up. Because it's persistence. You may have to change tactics. You may have to change strategy, but don't give up. If you really believe that, that man, that woman, that friend of yours is a believer in Christ, don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. Remember that Jesus is patient. God is patient with us as sinners. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow about His promises. Some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is slow about bringing back the return of Christ because He wants you to come to know Christ and experience the joy of Christ, not the judgment of Christ. May we have the same mind when we rescue. Finally, rescuing a wanderer helps them repent of past sins and protects them against future sins. Look what he says. Let him, who know, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. When you rescue that wanderer, you allow them uh, uh, an understanding to, to put their sins in perspective and they have a chance to repent of the past sins. And as you've rescued them, you've kept them from committing future sins and therefore kept them from experiencing future judgment of the Lord. That's why we do the work of rescuing, to bring them back, to rescue them often from themselves, right? So as we close, I want to give you a few tips to help us be effective rescuers. This is not on the screen. I, I put this together after I had, had made this slide up. But just four things. Number one, recognize Christ first rescued you and you're called to rescue others. Now that is for personal evangelism as we share the gospel with the lost, but it's also for our brothers and sisters who've fallen. Number two, the process is always to be guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is not a work of ourself, our strength, our wisdom, our might. It is guided and empowered by by the Holy Spirit. Number three, our motives and attitudes are as important as our actions. Don't do this with wrong motives. Don't entertain this with wrong attitudes. Meekness, humbleness, and gentleness is what is needed. Because we can tell the truth to someone, but we can tell it to them in a way that cuts them instead of heals them. Number four, the process may be long, but I promise you it will bear much fruit from you. And you may be here this morning and you hear this about being a wanderer. And you say, well, I, I'm not even a part of the church. I'm not even a part of Christ. I don't even know Christ. Beloved, this message is so much for you. If you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want you to hear my words with, with utmost sincerity and seriousness. Your very soul is at stake. Your eternal soul is at stake here. Christ has come. We, we, we just sang it. I spoke about it in our offering talk. Christ has come and He's paid the price for not part of your sin, but all of your sin. And I want to let you know, Christ has come to rescue you today. Don't put off a decision to follow Christ. Don't put off responding to the conviction of the Spirit that is on your heart right now. Don't put that off. Respond to the Lord today. The Bible tells us when we, we have faith in what Jesus has done on the cross, we confess Jesus the Lord that we shall be saved. Today is the day of your salvation. And as our team comes this morning, I want us to ready ourselves 
to make a decision to follow Jesus this morning. You may be one who is a Christian and you've found yourself here this morning and you realize that you maybe are sliding down this path to wonder from Jesus, to wonder from the truth of the gospel. And this message is for you to keep you from doing that. You may be here and realize that, that you have strayed. Beloved, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Turn and come back today. You, you may be here and recognize that you have a bad heart or attitude to those who have wandered. And you need to repent of that because God has people in your life that He needs you to rescue, but He needs to get your heart and your mind right first. And beloved, like I said, you may be here and don't know Christ. This day is the day of your salvation. Would you stand with me? My question for you this morning is this. Are you in need of rescuing? I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. We're going to have our pastors up here. If you need prayer for something, we'd be honored to pray with you. If you'd like to make a decision moving forward with our church about membership or baptism, we'd love to help walk you through that process. Love it. If you need to recommit your life to Christ, you've wandered off, but you want to recommit that. You want to get back on the path. Today is the day. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, we will celebrate with you. Don't let today pass you by. Father God, thank you for the moment you've given us right now that comes as a culmination of your gospel, your word, your spirit ministering to our hearts. Would you turn us to Jesus this morning that we may honor you, that we may put aside pride, that we put aside self-insurance, and we give ourselves fully to the one who's given all for us. Glorify yourself, Christ. Be merciful to us, God. Move among us, God. We ask this in Jesus' name.